You guys ready to finish Exodus this morning? Be here till three in the morning. We can do that, right? Paul preached all night. Guy falls out a window dead. They keep preaching. We could do this. We could do this. Who has to work tomorrow? Let's do it. All right, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word. Father, we are so grateful. As Bud said, this Word is alive. It's living. It's powerful. When we approach Your Word, Lord, we know we're not approaching a dead book. There is no other book like this. This is the living word. This is your word. We know that we can trust every word we read as truth. And we know that you use this word, your holy word, by your Holy Spirit, and you speak into our lives. You speak truth into our lives. You divide between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. And Lord, we need to hear from you this morning. We came here this morning so that you could speak to us. So, Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us. We ask that you would speak to us, that you would help us to hear. I pray that you would prepare each one of our hearts now to hear what you have to say. Lord, help us to not hear the things that Adam would say this morning, but only hear the things that you would say this morning. And I pray that you would speak, and we thank you for it. We know that you will, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How did we get here? Where are we at? What's happened so far? Moses, 40 years after being, you know, this this unique beginning, destiny on his life, parents who recognize the destiny, 40 years in Pharaoh's palace being trained, 40 years in the desert being trained, meets God in the desert after 80 years of training, has this back and forth with God, wrestling with God and and his destiny. God keeps kind of adjusting the plan with Moses because Moses is, is basically arguing with God, right? It's out of disbelief. It's out of a lack of faith. It's out of a not quite trusting God's plan. Um, so God keeps working with him. Finally, Moses is like, I don't want to go. That's when God gets... You know, that's when there's, there's, uh, there's some chastisement. That's when God gets upset. Um, but Moses goes. There's the death grip in the desert because of the circumcision. We talk a lot about covenant. We've looked a lot, a lot at covenant, right? It's a very important subject here. We're going to be reminded of that again this morning. Moses finally does come to the people of Israel after these 80 years and, and, and all of this. And he shows them the signs with Aaron. And they do believe, just as God said they would, that that he has come, that God has heard, that God knows their their situation. He's heard. And just as he had told uh, their forefathers that he was going to bring them out and that he was going to give them the land that he had promised them, that he had covenanted with them. So they were excited and they believed. They go, yeah, this is great. And then we go off script for a minute. Moses and Aaron, pretty excited. We don't see any of the normal, which we're going to see this morning, the difference. We don't see any of the normal. Then God commanded and they obeyed. We just see them go, that was awesome. Let's go talk to Pharaoh. And they run into Pharaoh and they start going off script. Right? They go back to the original thing that God told them to do, which was, a message when they didn't have the signs and when it was just Moses and he was supposed to take the elders, but now it's Moses and, and Aaron and they have the signs and so it was different, right? And, and, then, and then they say something that Moses was never told to say, oh, if you don't let us go, God's going to fall upon us with pestilence and a sword. That was never spoken of. And so, so, so Pharaoh goes, oh yeah, why are you not working? What's wrong with you guys? And he lays a heavier burden on the people. He, he tries to crush the people. He tries to, to make this look like God has brought more evil upon the people. Like Satan always does. He tries to make it look like our faith is actually hurting us. Right? That's what Satan always does. And so, so here's where we're at. This is the situation. This is where we pick up this morning. 
verse 19 of chapter 5. And the officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble after it was said, you shall not reduce any bricks from your daily quota. They saw they were in trouble. They had been in a lot of trouble. This is one of those, really? You think you're in trouble now? The Pharaoh has been killing your babies. The Pharaoh has been killing your babies. You've been enslaved for, for hundreds of years, and now you think you're in trouble? Like all of a sudden, oh, we're in trouble. Yeah, you, you, got, your, you, you got your mind messed up here. Now you're in trouble? Okay. Verse 20. Then as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And this is really telling. This is Moses and Aaron powerless. They're outside twiddling their thumbs. Wow, we really blew it. We messed up big time. They don't know what to do. This, this thing's gone. Now, remember, we said this last week. I don't know that Pharaoh wouldn't have done this anyways. I don't know that he would have. I don't know what would have done, what would have happened if they would have stayed on script. Pharaoh may have done the exact same thing either way, right? We don't, we don't know that. We don't, we don't know either way because they went off script. This is what happened. This is historically what happened. All we know is that they did go off script and as a result of that, Pharaoh pressed hard, right? He may have done that either way. But we do know that he wasn't going to let the children grow either way. He was going to say, probably, who is this Lord that I should obey him? No, I'm not letting the people go. That was going to be his response, whether they stayed on script or not. But at this point, Moses and Aaron, yeah, they, they messed up here a little bit, right? And the people come out to meet Moses and Aaron, verse 21, and they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge. And, and this isn't like light speech. Okay, if you look in the Hebrew here, this is literally saying they're asking God to, to, to bring judgment down upon Moses and Aaron. That's what, they're, that's what that statement is. They're saying, let God judge you. They're, it's not just like, hey, just to, you know, like to see if you're right or wrong. No, no, no. This is asking for God to bring judgment on them. For what has happened to them. What? They, no. They're, 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 they, this happens to us though. When things, especially when we go off script. When we take things into our own hands. And like we talked about last week. How many times have we done this? Did you spend any time this week thinking of the times you've done this? I, I, I do this all the time unfortunately. I try not to do this. But the Lord starts leading in our lives, starts, you know, he gives us direction, he gives us a movement, and there's, God's doing something, and we see him moving, and, and it's exciting, and then we go, this is great, Lord, I got this, and we start running. And we just, we take it from there, and it's the old foolish Galatians. What you began in the spirit, you're now going to complete in the flesh? I mean, that's what we're seeing here. They started out, just as the Lord said, go show the Israelites, do these miracles. Everything was happening, and then all of a sudden they run in off script. They run in in their own flesh. And now they're upset that it is going wrong, even though God actually told them it would go this way. Right? God actually told them it would go this way. But they're confused, and they're, and they're frustrated. Continuing in verse 21, because you have made us abhorrent. Abhorrent, that that's like stinks. We stink. We smell horrible to Pharaoh. We stink in his sight. And in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Because they were so nice to us before. I mean, we were just in their graces before. They only killed our babies. But other than that, you know, we were slaves. And we had a quota that we had to meet every day. And, well, they didn't pay us. And yeah, things were great before you got here. You see how easily we can get off track and, and, and like not recognize the circumstances we are in? And that's what the enemy is doing here. He's messing with their minds. 
He's, he's confusing them so that they're not recognizing what's, what the reality was anymore. And all of a sudden they're starting to think. And it's just like what happens with Israel when they're in the desert. They start looking back at Egypt and going, Oh, if we were still in Egypt, the leeks and the onions and the great things we had to eat. Oh, and the slavery and the killing of your babies. Don't forget that too. And, and, that, and they're already doing that. They're already start, starting to think about just a few minutes ago, it was a little bit better than it is now. So God judge you, Moses and Aaron, for having made this worse for us. So that's the situation. Verse 22. That's what Israel does, which, let me just say this. The Bible doesn't tell us that every single Israelite person of an elder that comes out of Israel went to hell. Right? The Bible doesn't say that. But as a group, in a foreshadow, in a shadowing picture, in a type, they are a picture of false, false conversion. That's what Hebrews uses them as, right? They're a picture of false conversion. But you don't get to say they all went to hell, right? That's, that's, not, that's not what that is. Every, every one that fell in the desert and didn't make it into the promised land, guess who fell in the desert with them? Moses didn't go into the promised land, right? So, so Moses is also a picture. Moses is a picture of the law at that point. The law can't bring you into the promised land. So he didn't go into the promised land because then that would have been a picture of the law bringing you into the promised land, which God wouldn't allow, right? So, so you, you don't get to go there. But here, for the, the picture's sake, they run to Pharaoh and they are not making good choices in their decisions. And they're actually saying, God judged the two that God has sent us to help us, right? But Moses, in contrast, is actually a picture here for us of what it looks like of, of, to be saved, of what being saved looks like. And so what do they do? What does Moses do? So Moses, verse 22, returned to the Lord. See, you may find yourself in these positions where you go off script, where God started a good work in you, started you down the road, you started following and the path you were supposed to follow, he set you on, and then you go, I got this, and you started running. And if you're like me, you again, you've done it way more times than you'd like to admit. But when you do trip and fall and falter, you as a born-again person, where do you go? You do go back to Jesus. Because you're saved and he is your father. Well, Jesus, you know, you go back to the father, right? You go back to Jesus. You go back to your Savior. Because you're His. Moses goes back to the Lord. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Now what he says, we can all relate to, because probably all of us have done this. Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name... He has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. What does Moses do? Straight up complains. He complains. Lord, I don't get it. I don't understand. Now, to be, you know, from our vantage point, Moses, okay, let's, God told you this would happen like this. Right? Like numerous times God told you, he's not going to let the people go until we, until I, pardon me, until God, you know, until Yahweh puts pressure on him, until my wonders, until without a strong hand, he's not going to let the people go. So you're going to tell him, but he's not, I know, the Lord says, I know he will not relent. He will not listen to you. So God told him he was going to do this. So Moses already forgot that, right? And, and, and not, you know, second thing here, you went off script. So the evil that has come upon the people, again, whether this wouldn't or would have or wouldn't have happened, for sure what has happened seems to be a, a more of a result of Moses's not going the way God told him to go. That's where we're at, Right? But yet, Moses wants to throw this back at God. And you know what I found out about God? He can handle my complaints. 
Do you know he can, he can handle your complaints? And I'm not saying that it's necessarily healthy to only go and just, you're in your prayer life, your prayer life is just nothing but complaining. But I do think that it's okay for me to be honest with God about where I'm at. I think that's called relationship. And if there's some times where I need to tell God, listen, Lord, I'm confused. And I'm not sure what you're doing right now. And I'm a little upset with, with, with how things are going. And I'm frustrated. And I'm, I'm having a hard time with this. I'm having a hard time with, with how this is going. Now, now, I understand in those situations, I understand I'm wrong, right? Like, like pretty much I'm wrong. Because God is good and he's always right, right? So, so if I don't understand what's going on, and I'm, especially if I'm accusing him of something, like, I'm wrong. But he's not, ups, he's not being, God's not thrown off by that. You know what I mean? He's not thrown off by that. And how do I know? Because verse, chapter 6, verse 1, isn't God throwing it back at Moses. I, I, I noticed this. God doesn't throw this back at Moses. You know what God does? This morning, we're going to watch. God takes Moses' focus and he puts it on himself. God puts Moses' focus on, on God. Instead of saying, what, Moses? You're the one that blew this thing. I told you this, but you're... He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He actually takes his focus and puts it on himself. And that's what we're told to do, gang. Do you know that if you want to overcome your flesh, you want to overcome sin in your life, you want to be more like Jesus, don't go focusing on you. That's not how you're going to do it. You go focusing on you, and you're going to be frustrated. And you're going to fail at overcoming your flesh. If you want to grow as a Christian... If you want to be more like Jesus, put your focus on Jesus. You put your attention on Him. All of your attention on Him. And you become very small. And He becomes very large. And pretty soon you don't really matter anymore. It's all about Him. And next thing you know, you're looking more and more like Him. And you're walking more and more like Him. And you're talking more and more like Him. But if you start putting your attention on you and your sin, and your struggles. Now, what I'm not saying is you ignore it. If he convicts you of sin, what are you supposed to do? Confess your sin. Agree with God that it is sin. Recognize that Jesus has paid for that sin. Thank him for that. Believe him for that. And move on. And then if he convicts you again, you do the same thing. But all of that is doing what? Putting your attention on, on him. And that's what God does. He doesn't, he doesn't beat Moses up. Moses came to him. Moses came to him, and so he takes him, and he puts all of his attention on him. Verse 1 of chapter 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, What's wrong with you? Well, that's what I would say to Moses. That is not what God says to Moses. He says, Now you shall see. Moses, you've really been wanting to see. Now you shall see. Now you shall see. Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Who's going to do it? Who? God's going to do it. God's going to do this thing. Not Moses. Not Aaron. Not the people. God's going to do this thing. Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. First thing God does is he reminds Pharaoh, or reminds Moses what he's going to do. He says, For with a strong hand, he will let them go. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. First thing he reminds him is what he's going to do. I'm going to do this. He is going to drive them out. He is going to let them go. This is going to happen. Now, interesting in the language here, very interesting. The Hebrew language, as it's written in verse 1, does not require that it is either God or Pharaoh that is doing the driving. So when it says here, it says, For with a strong hand he will let them go. 
It doesn't require that it is God's strong hand or that it's Pharaoh's strong hand. The Hebrew language actually leaves it open that it could be either. And, and I thought that was really interesting because so often when we go and study the Greek, like, you know, you go in Paul's letters and you start doing a language study. It, it's, it makes it very clear once you start digging into the language, so these kinds of details aren't left to the questioning in, in much of the Greek language when we get Greek is just that way. It dials it in if, if they wanted to. And Paul, Paul's writings almost always do. They dial it in. They, they point you in the direction. It's like, yep, that, that's, that's who I'm talking about right there. Right? And in here, and the Hebrew has that capability oftentimes, but Hebrew is more of a picturesque, deep, numerical, it's just a very, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar. What I know about it, though, is that you can dive into it like an ocean, swim around in it, and come out and go, yeah, I learned a little bit, but woo! You know, it's so deep, right? It's deep and wide. But everything I read on this says it doesn't dictate whether it is God's strong hand or Moses or Pharaoh's strong hand. And I think that's for a reason. It is God's strong hand that causes Pharaoh's strong hand to do it. Get, get what I'm saying? God, God brings a strong hand and then Pharaoh with what power he has in Egypt uses his strong hand. Does that make sense? And I, so I think it's both. And that's the beauty of how it's written. And that's the majesty of God's word. So, so when you find something like this where it doesn't dictate, you go, it's exactly as it's supposed to be because it is both. It is both. If it dictated one or the other, it wouldn't make as much sense. Because God, God's strong hand makes Pharaoh's position use a strong hand. Because if you recall, Pharaoh does drive them out. Get out! You know, when he finally does it's like, get out! He does, he drives them out of the land. He doesn't just go, yeah, I guess you can go. At the end. That's not how, that's not how it happens when he finally leaves them. So, so God here says, listen, with a strong hand, he's not just going to let them go. He's going to command you to get out of Egypt. Get out. But it's not ultimately, ultimately, it isn't Pharaoh's strong hand. It's God's strong hand that does it. Amen? And so we see both fitting into that verse so beautifully. Verse 2. And God spoke to Moses. So God, so, so God tells Moses right off the top, I am going to do this. This is going to happen. And it's not just going to happen passively. It's going to happen with strength, with power. Okay, this isn't just something that's going to, oh, I guess it'll slightly happen. No, no, no. It's going to really happen, right? It's going to really happen. Verse 2, and God spoke to Moses and said to him, and here's what God does, number 2, he reminds Moses who he is. I am the Lord. He opens it up with, I am the Lord. And that's what we need to remember in these moments. We need to remember that in every moment, amen? Don't we always need to remember that? There's so many times I forget that. I forget that in my own life about like who I am versus who he is. I forget that in my own life regarding people who have authority over me. You know what I mean? Like, Because we all have somebody in authority over us, right? In this world, in this life, there are people, I mean, just go drive 110 on the freeway for a little while and find out that you have people who have authority over you, right? Because you're going to go to jail eventually. And try to resist that. Don't do this. I'm not telling you to do this. But if you did, you would find very quickly how many people have authority over you. Right? But ultimately, they are not the Lord. There is one Lord. There is one God. I am the Lord, he says. He's putting Moses' focus back on himself. He's reminding him, I am. I am. I am over this. I am the Lord. I know what is going on. This is my plan. I am sovereign over this. Pharaoh is not in control. Pharaoh is not the Lord. Pharaoh is not the one who is pulling the, the dial or pulling the switches and turning the dials. Pharaoh is not God. I am the Lord. 
He said, I appeared to Abraham, verse 3, to Isaac and to Jacob, as God Almighty, but my, by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. We mentioned this verse previously when we were uh, looking at the I am, the first I am statements, right? And this verse trips some people up. I don't think it should, but it does. It trips some people up because Genesis is filled with the clear recognition that they knew the name of the Lord. They knew I am. They knew Yahweh, Jehovah, right? So when he says, by my name, they did not know me, then, then that trips the people up. They're like, well, how? And there's all kinds of like commentaries written about this uh, in, in like people trying to explain it. And I think it's actually fairly simple. And, and there are some that take the simple approach, which I agree. Okay, I agree. It's the, it's the Jewish idiom, it's the, the, the basic understanding that to know someone's name is to understand who they are, right? That's, that's all this is talking about. So God is saying, they knew me as God Almighty. In other words, they knew I could, they knew some things about me. And that's like Adonai, right? I believe, I believe God Almighty is the, the translation of Adonai. Don't, don't hold me to that one. So I might be wrong. Um, but I believe that's what it is. Regardless, God Almighty, you know, they knew the power of God. They knew um, the supply of God. They knew some attributes of God. And he's talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, but, but, but they didn't know my name. They didn't understand who I am. And remember, we've talked about this, right? There, there are two primary... Um, revelatory messages in, in, in the two historical events that God is seeking to deliver in the Exodus and in the birth, you know, life and birth and death of, of Jesus. And what is that? Who God is and his way of salvation. Of course, within those, as we've said, there are lots of things that God, you know, teaches us and, and declares to us. But, but if you wrap it up into two simple things, that, that is what it would be. And then, and then there's a progressive revelation in his word um, in between those events, right? To give us a few more details here and there. Correct? You understand? And so that makes sense. He says, uh, 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 I was not known to them. Throughout this event, God is making himself known. That is what he is seeking to do. Uh, I am making myself known. He says, verse 4, I have also established my covenant with them. To give them uh, the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. So God says, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to let these people go. I am the Lord. He's, he's bringing Moses back. He's reminding him of everything he's been telling them. He's putting his focus back on him. Here's what I'm going to do. Remember, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Uh I am doing this to make myself known. This is what I'm doing here. I'm making myself known. And, and remember that this is about the covenant. I am keeping my covenant. Right? I am going to give them this land. So, so God is, is bringing Moses back into remembrance of all the things he's already told him. You know, he already shared all of these things. But he's realigning his focus. He's reminding him of these things. Have you been there before? Have you read a scripture, sat in a Bible study, had a time of prayer, whatever it was, shared with a brother or sister, and the Lord spoke something to you and it was like, Oh yeah, I remember. I knew that. I knew that. The Lord has said that to me before. I remember the scripture said that before. And it's like one of the most basic Christian understandings. And for some reason, in the midst of all of your kind of flailing around or running or this or that or trouble, you just forgot. You just forgot. You know, that's the thing about us, guys. There's a reason why the scriptures, there's a reason why God likens us to sheep. There's a reason. Now, I'm not trying to be mean here. I'm not trying to be mean. But sheep are really stupid. Sheep are really dumb animals. If sheep don't have a shepherd, they would die. Right? You can't just put sheep out in the wild and go, All right, little sheep, go have a good life. 
That sheep is dead. It is a dead sheep. A, a sheep without a shepherd is a dead sheep. They will, I've heard, I've never seen it, I've never been a shepherd, but I've heard some things about sheep, and I believe most of these things are true. One of the things I've heard is they will drown in rain. Like, they'll literally look up and drown. They'll walk off cliffs. They won't go look for food. They'll starve. If they don't get, you know, if they don't even just get sheared, they'll die just because their, their, their wool will grow to the point where they'll just overheat and die. They're just helpless, stupid animals. They need someone to take care of them. They don't know where to go. They, they could have water right over there that they had found before. Right over there. They won't remember that it's over there. And they won't go drink it. They have to be led to it. Guys, I said it last week. I told you I'd keep telling you. I'm never going to stop telling you. I'm going to tell you every time it comes to mind. I will always keep telling you this. You need to keep being in this book. If you're not in this book every day, all the time, constantly, you are forgetting things that the Lord wants you to know. You are. You just are. And so am I. We are doing that. And Moses is. Moses, is, this was, I don't know how many days or weeks ago that God had this really insane experience where there was this burning bush and God shared all of these things. And it's just a, just a little bit, and he is in the middle of this crazy momentous experience. And here God is reminding him of these things again that Moses has apparently forgotten. Right? Have you ever stood in front of a burning bush where God spoke to you like that and had that kind of experience etched into your mind? If you have, please talk with me after service. Michelle, if you could be in that meeting with me. <laughs> I'm just saying. You might need some medication. Maybe not. I don't know. My point is, you need to be in the Word, because we forget, we forget, we forget, and God wants to remind us of these things. Remind us of how much He loves us. Remind us of how much we're saved. Remind us of how much He forgives us. Remind us of how much He'll use us. Remind us of how much sin damages us. Remind us of these things. So we have to be in His Word, and in His Word, remind us of His promises. Remind us that we just live in a tent. This is just a tent. I'm just in a tent right now. I've got a, I've got a mansion waiting for me. This is not my mansion. Stop worrying so much about the tent. Look forward to the mansion. Don't live for this life. Live for that one. He reminds us of these things. Because this life is pretty attractive in some ways. Especially living here in the West. With all of our comforts. I'm thankful for my freedom. I'm thankful for these things. But they can lull us to sleep. So we need to be reminded. He's reminding him. Hey, and, and here God is reminding him of his covenant. God needs to remind us that he's the one who saved us. That we don't work for it. We don't keep it. We didn't gain it by our good efforts and by our works. And he's reminding Moses of that right here. Moses, you're not doing this thing. This isn't you. You ran up in there thinking, oh, I got this now. I'm the redeemer. Yeah, remember how that worked out with the Egyptian before? Not so good. I'm doing this, God says, because it's my covenant, and I'm keeping my covenant with these people. Not you. You're an instrument. I will use you for my glory. But it's not you. And he reminds us of these things. Verse 5, And I have also heard the groaning. See, he was, he was blaming God. You haven't let these people go at all. All is gone. All that's happened is more evil has come upon them. He says, I have heard the groaning of the children of Israel from the Egyptians, um, uh, Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage and have remembered my covenant. Moses, you think I don't know what's going on with them? Do you know how absolutely horrific it is when we accuse God regarding the evils in the world as if he, he is standing around not caring about 
the atrocities in the world? That is one of the most evil, satanic, demonic things that could possibly be done is when God gets accused. Well, if he's such a good God, why are there so much evil in the world? James says, do not be deceived. When we start throwing accusations against God, there's a reason why Pastor Sharp comes up here. Every time he comes up here, he is compelled to remind you of the goodness of God. There's a reason for that. Because we tend to forget when we live in a world that does have so much evil. But that is not charged against him. It's because we sin. He never sins. And he remembers and cares. He knows. And he's like, Moses, I know. I know. That's why I'm here. That's what we're doing. Verse 6, therefore say to the children. So this is every, everything he said to Moses. First he reminds Moses. And now he's like, now say this to the children. What does he say? What's the first thing he says? Look at verse 6. You need to remind them of the same first thing. I am the Lord. That's the first thing you need to say to them. I will bring you out. Here's what I'm going to do. But listen, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Oh, what an amazing verse. Oh, is that fantastic. This is, this, is, this is what Jesus has done for us. Amen? This is what Jesus has done for us. This is what Jesus wants to do for your neighbor. This is what Jesus wants to do for your unsaved relative. This is what Jesus wants to do for every single person in this world that is not submitted to Him, that is still in bondage and enslaved to sin. This is what He came to do. This is what He desires to do. Starts with, I am the Lord. Who does it? Who does the saving? Who does it, church? Salvation is the Lord's. Salvation is the Lord's. You know, when the children of Israel came out of Pharaoh, let the Lord judge you, Moses and Aaron. There's something telling about that. Who were they thinking came to save them? Yeah. They were putting too much stock in Moses and Aaron too, weren't they? We got to be careful that people don't, you know, we got to make sure that we're always pointing to Jesus, right? I mean, as a church, we don't want ever, anybody to ever look at our church and be like, well, I go to that church, therefore I'm, no, uh, uh, uh. oh, no, 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 no. You go to a church, that's great, but going to a church does not have anything to do with whether you are going to be with Jesus in the end. <laughs> do you know Jesus? That is the question, right? Well, people can latch on to other people. If you were to no longer be a friend of your friend, would they still walk with Jesus? Or are they attached to you? Your children, at some point, they need to have a relationship with Jesus apart from you. Your spouse, would your spouse walk with Christ apart from you? You get what I'm saying? All of this is important. I am the Lord. He does the saving. I will bring them out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Matthew. Matthew 11. This is what Jesus wants to do. Matthew 11. You want to turn there. We're going to finish Exodus this morning, so just buckle up, guys. We're... You laugh. Why? Why is there laughter? You're like, well, you might. We're leaving. 
I wonder if I tried to do that. How many of you, like how long, when would the last person stay? What do you think? Two o'clock? There'd be like one person still here? My wife would leave at about one. She's like, I'm gone, man. You are crazy. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus says, actually, I want to read the whole um, from 25. It's very interesting. Verse 25. At that time, y'all there? Matthew 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. See? I am the Lord. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Listen, verse 28. Who does, who does Jesus will to reveal? Come to me, all you who labor. Anyone. Anyone that will come to him. He wants to reveal to anyone. Come to me. Verse 28. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It is God's desire to free us from the heavy yoke, the difficult burden. That is what he has come to do. That is what he is declaring here that he is going to do for these people. He says, I will... I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Christian, are you carrying around a heavy load this morning? Are you burdened? Do you have a heavy yoke? I would suggest if that's the case, you might be carrying something the Lord has not given you to carry. Because as we read the scriptures, that's not how he's, that's not what he's uh, uh, saying we should be doing. So if yours is difficult and heavy, then, then whose are you carrying? Because his is light and easy. His is light and easy. You've, you've heard the picture of the yoke, right? Y'all know what that is? It's, it, it was a wooden, wooden structure that, that the, the two... What the yaks? What would they put in these things? Cows or bulls or whatever. Not cows. Probably bulls. Ox. Ox. I think ox is what they use. Maybe bulls too, right? I don't know. But they put ox in them. And they literally like, because it's wood. Wood doesn't flex real well, right? So they would have these things designed for the animals. You know what I mean? They, they did actually, a carpenter would make them for the animals. So they fit the animal. And they would actually take a really big one. And a not so big one, not so large one, and they would they would yoke them together. So they so they instead of putting two big ones together, they would actually put a big one and a lesser one together, and a big one and a lesser one together. So the big one would help the lesser one, and they would get more work out of two big ones rather than putting two big ones together. So that's how they would do this. And and what Jesus is basically saying, you're the lesser one, you yoke up with him when he'll do the heavy lifting. He's gonna do the pooling, right? And that's the whole picture of it. You're, you're not the big one in, in the group. You get that? You're not the one doing the pulling. He is. He's the one that's doing the heavy lifting. You're just coming alongside, or he's coming alongside. So, so what burdens are you carrying today that you shouldn't be carrying around? I mean, if it's sin, if it's sin, if you're, if you're walking around with sin in your life today, Christian, it's time to, to repent, right? It's, it's time to, to stop. It's time to take that sin, turn to Christ with it, 
lay it at his feet, allow him to, to cleanse you, to forgive you, allow him to do that work. Because that sin is eating you up, it's separating you, it's hurting you. If it's guilt and shame, it's been nailed to the cross. And it's keeping you from the relationship that you could be having with Him. You don't need to carry that anymore. He nailed that to the cross for you. Is it expectations and things that maybe you've built up that, that Jesus hasn't said? Listen, give that to Jesus. Let Him be Lord over that. I don't know what it is. Maybe you don't know what it is. You know, sometimes we're burdened and, and we don't even know what it is. Have you been there? I've been there. I've been there. Do you know what, though? He knows what it is. The, the, the Word of God knows what it is. It's able to divide between the soul and the spirit. It's, it's able to cut between those things. So take that to Jesus. Lord, I, I'm actually really burdened, but I don't even know exactly why. I'm just feeling angst. And it's a frustration in my life and in my family. And I don't know why. Take it to Jesus. Confess that. Don't carry it around anymore. Yeah, I've been doing that. Okay, keep doing it. Do it as many times as it takes. Because every time you do it, guess what? You're drawing closer to Jesus. You're going to the source. That's what he wants. He wants relationship. He wants closeness. He wants to be near to you. As we started the message, when Moses came close, God didn't focus him on him. You never see once, as we go through this, you never see God turn to Moses and go, you know, Moses, this was all your fault. If you hadn't done this the wrong way, we wouldn't be here. You actually don't find that at all in this passage. You never find that. Not that the Holy Spirit doesn't convict us, but the Holy Spirit's conviction is this. Come close so I can forgive you and cleanse you. Not, look at what a mess you've made of things. You're a real jerk. That's not the Holy Spirit's voice. That's the enemy. Or maybe your own flesh. But that's not the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit speaks, it's words of reconciliation. It's words of peace. To the Christian. To you who are born again. It's words that say, come near my child. So that I can heal you. So that I can free you from this burden. So Christian... Whatever it is this morning that is keeping you heavy and loaded, whatever it is, today, will you just give it to Jesus? Will you just give it to him today? Because he wants to take it from you this morning. I know it. You know it. It's true. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we